for this. <laughs> there we go. So we are open on a limited capacity. Um, and my collection is available through Digital Indie. So I will definitely drop that link in the chat if you are interested in doing any kind of research from home. Um, just let me know. Also, if you would like to be added to the email list, go ahead and type yes in the chat and I can put you on an email list to let you know about all the other upcoming programs here from the Indianapolis Special Collections Room. Um, as we know it so far, we're just gonna do all of our, our programming virtual this year through the, throughout the remainder of 2020. Uh, so if you would like to be added to the list and, and know when the upcoming programs are coming, uh, just type in yes in the chat. We'll get you added to that. Um, I know that some people were looking forward to the How to Save Your Stuff Archively at Home um, workshop that was going to happen in March, and I'm working with that presenter to get it rescheduled. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, so if you have questions for Jackie, um, please type those in the chat. At the end, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, this program today wouldn't be possible without the um, work of the library, the Public Library Foundation and through a generous grant from Indiana Humanities. So I wanna thank both of those partnering institutions for helping us out. I will also put in a survey in the chat for you to fill out just because this is our very first virtual lecture in the ISCR lecture series. So I definitely wanna get your feedback on how to make it better, how to improve and things like that. So I'll type, I'll put the uh, survey in the chat, but I'm sure you're all gonna say great things about Jackie because she is wonderful. She's a wonderful presenter. Um, full disclosure, Jackie and I, we were in the public history program at IUPUI. Um, however, we were both so busy, so I didn't even know about the amazing research that she was doing um, until after she graduated. So thank goodness for social media, Jackie, because I found out uh, her research topic and on Grace Julian Clark, and I was like, we have to get her in here. We have to get her in front of the public to share this research. Um, the ISCR lecture series is all about um, historical research on Indianapolis. So getting those academic historians out of their institutions and right here in front of the public, in front of you guys. Um, so I'm very excited to have Jackie Sweetheart with us today. And I'm so excited to learn more about woman suffragist Grace Julian Clark. Um, Jackie Sweetheart currently works for the Indiana Office of Community and Rural Affairs, downtown Indianapolis. And her title is Indiana Main Street Coordinator. So she is documenting the architectural history of Indiana. And so I'm really excited to hear her research today, but also learn about what Jackie's gonna do next, because I'm sure you're gonna do amazing things after this. So uh, without further ado, I present to you all the great historian, Jackie Sweetheart. Thank you so much. Let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see my screen, Stephen? Yes, I can. Okay. I can see it perfect. Great, let me minimize that. Okay, should be good there. Well, hi everybody, thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first public talk on Grace Jillian Clark. And like Stephen said, it's wonderful to be able to share that information um, with the public instead of just having it live in a document online. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, my talk today is titled The Undefeatable Grace Julian Clark. Um, I'll tell you a bit about why I titled it that here in a second, but that term undefeatable actually came from a, an Indiana newspaper um, in Rushville. It's called the Rushville Republican. Um, and I just really love that because again, you'll see why here in a second. But before we dive into the content, I wanted to just share a few notes with you guys real quick. My talk today is a condensed version of my master's thesis, which I defended this past fall in November. Oh wait, no, I defended in September, got my degree in November. And the goal of my thesis was to analyze the correspondence of Grace Julian Clark in order to see what her impact was during the time in which she lived. And what I ultimately concluded was that between the years of 1915 and 1920, she really emerged as a political actor through her activities. 
So my talk and my thesis are both broken up into three parts. Um, the first part looking at her state influence, the second part looking at her national work primarily through World War I, and then the last section looks at her international efforts. Um, throughout each of these parts, I will also evaluate Clark's relationship to and influence from her father, George Julian, and his work as a US congressman throughout each section. So there's some goals that I have for us today. I hope that by the end of the talk, you'll find a common theme that Clark didn't give up, even when she experienced what might be seen as failure. She was essentially undefeatable at being defeated because she did in fact experience defeat and challenges on multiple occasions, but she really never let that stop her. Another note that I wanted to mention before we begin is to just keep in mind that Grace Julian Clark, she was privileged in society and that privilege that allowed her to become a unique and notable voice for many women in Indiana and not all women had the same opportunities to do so. Socioeconomic factors, race, background, level of education, her marriage, these all played factors in her ability to do what she did. And lastly, while I hope that you see she was indeed a suffragist, as most people know and remember her as. I hope by the end of this talk that you walk away realizing that she was much more than that. Um, I argue that she's a true political actor. And then real quick, just some notes on the resources that I used uh, for my research. My entire thesis relies heavily on the letters found in the Grace Julian Clark collection at the Indiana State Library. Uh, keep in mind that the materials in her collection were compiled from my understanding entirely by her and she donated the collection to the library. But now as Stephen pointed out to me in a Twitter conversation, it's also important to remember that at some point when Clark donated the collection, it did go through the hands of other people as well. And so while I don't at this time know anything about the archivist on staff who processed her collection, it's important to remember that information could have been removed from the collection depending on whether the archivist weeded information out as a gatekeeper. So the point I'm trying to make there is just to say that what I present to you today um, what's part of the collection is just as important as what's missing. So for example, there is evidence of Clark's work for women's suffrage in the black community, but that will not be present in this talk today. So while Grace did attend African American women's clubs and suffrage meetings, as historian Dr. Anita Morgan uncovered in her research, evidence of that work is not in Clark's collection, but rather you can find that work in newspapers. So what I'm trying to emphasize before we dive in is that this is not meant to be a tell all of Clark's life. Rather, it's really intended to just highlight the activities between 1915 and 1920 based on the sources in her collection. And you'll see throughout this talk that I've complemented the correspondence in her collection with newspaper articles to help provide some context. So just a quick intro, a high level overview of who Clark was in case you're totally unfamiliar. Clark, she's most notably remembered locally for her advocacy as a club woman, a journalist, and a staunch supporter of suffrage. But when it comes to her legacy at the national level, she goes largely unrecognized. Living and, prim living and working primarily in Irvington, Indiana, which was annexed by Indianapolis in 1902, she attended Indianapolis public schools and graduated from Butler University with her BA and MA in philosophy. And just for context, Butler University was located in Irvington during the time she attended. She's the daughter of George Julian and the granddaughter of Joshua Reed Giddings, both of whom were leading abolitionists and members of US Congress. Her mother, Laura Giddings, introduced her to women's organizations when she helped organize the Indianapolis Women's Club in 1875. She went on to then marry attorney Charles B. Clark later in life, and prior to their marriage, Charles had worked closely with her father, George Julian, as a U.S. deputy surveyor in the New Mexico Territory. In addition to practicing law, Charles also served in the Indiana Senate in 1913 and 1915. And as we'll talk about today, Grace was also a writer. She wrote for the Indianapolis Star from 1911 to 1929, and she authored three publications related to her father. 
So starting out with part one, we're going to look at her state influence, primarily um, an election that she was involved in. So Clark's influence really grew in a short span of time. In the years that were leading up to 1915, Clark had definitely made a name for herself at the local level and many around the state already knew who she was. But it wasn't until 1915 that I believe she really cemented her persona at the state level. And based on my research, I really attribute that to um, the ri her rise in recognizability to one main event which is the 1915 election for president of the Indiana Federation of Clubs. So the Indiana Federation of Clubs, it was basically a chapter of the General Federation of Women's Clubs, which was founded in 1890, and it had over 3,000 clubs across the country. Their primary goal was to promote civic improvements through volunteer service at local levels, and Clark herself was actually a founder and officer for the Indiana Federation of Clubs. So why talk about this election? I find this particular piece of Clark's story to be really compelling because when I started my research, I was truly taken aback by the way that these women wrote to one another. They were so direct and so opinionated and they just continued to go back and forth with each other without much give or take to the point that these women were admittedly exhausted and drained by the entire experience. So their disagreements, what they were really arguing and fighting with each other over, were really based on their differences in individual opinion. <clears throat> so for me, the election demonstrates how in some instances, women got in their own way of progress because they weren't able to see or compromise really beyond their immediate personal opinion or their immediate perspective. That's no doubt a reflection of their privilege that they even had the ability to choose between the urgent cause for suffrage and their personal objectives. But the point here is that women did have a tendency to let their own personal preference win out over the betterment of the whole, and they sometimes failed to unite together. It's not true for all facets of the suffrage movement, but it did appear to be the case uh, for this particular election. So this campaign, it illustrates women's underlying motivations and even more, it demonstrates that women involved were not afraid to act unladylike with one another behind closed doors, but I think more notably in public spaces as well. And while my full research dives more into the grit and the nuance of the campaign itself and discusses some implications for the suffrage movement in Indiana as a whole, um, for our purposes today, I'm going to focus primarily on Clark's role in the election and how I believe it elevated her position within the state. So let's jump into some of the details. During 1915, Clark acted as a campaign manager for a Terre Haute woman named Lenore Hannah Cox, who you see in the middle of your screen. Clark is on the far right, and then Lenore Hannah Cox is to her left. And although Cox was later soundly defeated by her opponent, Carolyn Fairbank of Fort Wayne, who you see on the top left of your screen, Cox's candidacy gained widespread attention from club women and also men all over the state because the allegations that were made were just, um, this, it wasn't normal during this time and it caught a lot of people's attention. So in the bottom left, you see Stella C. Stimson. Remember her face and remember her name because we're gonna talk about her here in a second. So Clark, she, I mean, truly detested Fairbanks campaign manager, and that's who Stella C. Stimson is. Stimson acted as Fairbanks campaign manager, whereas Clark really acted as Cox's campaign manager. And the reason why Clark detested Stimson was because of her participation in what Clark viewed as unethical campaign practices. Stimson aggressively accused Cox of being a woman who did things like smoke cigarettes, supported a saloon because her her husband owned property that was thought to be used as a saloon. Um, Stimson said Cox was a, was a woman who perpetually cursed and who was also an atheist. So the allegations Stimson and others made against Cox might sound somewhat silly by today's standards, but the rumors did carry a lot of weight during the early 20th century and definitely speak to the norms of the time. Many Hoosier reformers expected 
other reformers to maintain strict moral codes and the allegations that were made against Cox suggested that she behaved otherwise. Uh, so Cox and her supporters, they didn't hesitate to retaliate against Stimson and Clark spearheaded the campaign against Stimson, stating both publicly and privately that Stimson was a liar, a cheater, and a morally corrupt woman as demonstrated by her assault on Cox's character. And you can see how this played out in some of the local media from this political cartoon you see on your screen. So why does this all matter? Well, Grace Jillian Clark, she was at the forefront of this political conflict as was Stimson, even though neither women was actually running for the candidate, candidacy themselves. And because of Clark's influence, even as a campaign manager, the campaign really demonstrates how she was beginning to develop her political skills prior to women actually gaining the right to vote. And before this election, Clark may have been known around the state in circles of club women, but this event really catalyzed her into becoming a political actor. And she gained a lot of attention, like I said, from not only club women, but men too. And what makes this situation more interesting is that Clark had actually known Stimson for some time prior to this and had at least on one occasion actually vouched for her demeanor, uh, demonstrating that at one time, the two were at least somewhat friendly, if not good friends. But at this time during the campaign, Stimson even wrote Clark on multiple occasions warning her to not back Cox. But my favorite thing about Clark is that even with these warnings from Stimson and other women across the state, she could never be swayed. She continued to back Cox loyally, even when the current president of the Indiana Federation, Theda Newsom, wrote to Clark to warn her that she was on the wrong side of this debate. For Clark, however, a true woman was defined less by her private behavior and more by her public work. So the impact of this election was felt by people all across the state. You could see political cartoons playing out in local newspapers, such as the one shown here. You see women across the aisle yelling, um, not so nice things at one another. Um, it's one woman is yelling old hen, another is yelling old cat. There's a sign that says only bad women smoke cigarettes. Um, and you can see a few others on there as well. And as we progress through her journey tonight, you'll see how her statewide credibility really created opportunity for her beyond the campaign, at least through 1920. But here's another example of um, this cartoon is called Merely Electing a President. And I mean, you can see it's utter chaos, they're fighting. Again, there's the word hussy in there, bing, bang, bang, lots of fighting. So this is how the election was depicted um, in a public space through the local newspapers, which just shows you the impact it had. But to really understand the underlying motives behind Stimson and Clark, we have to add a layer of historical context. So in the years leading up to 1915, there was a growing discrepancy between temperance and suffrage motivations, with temperance groups fighting for abstinence of liquor and suffragists fighting for the vote. Stimson was well known to be what Clark called an anti-liquor enthusiast, while Clark generally saw female independence as the preferred goal over temperance. She believed Clark believe that gaining female independence first would allow women the power to push for other reform efforts, including temperance. It was clear, though, that through correspondence, the temperance issue was at the forefront of this campaign, and it demonstrates that the women involved, including Clark, they were motivated, again, by their personal ambition and their experiences, and they were pushing their individual goals of either temperance or suffrage within the Federation. While Clark's work during the campaign does reflect her strong desire to make women's suffrage the main priority within the Federation, it's also worth analyzing her possible ulterior motives due to her father's prior work. Clark explained her roots in a letter saying, my father had the honor of introducing the very first suffrage amendment in the Congress shortly after the Civil War, which owing to the exigencies of reconstruction politics was not pressed at that time. This is to show you why I cannot be a trimmer. 
I need not assure you that the thing I want above all others is that which will be the best for the great woman, the great woman movement, excuse me. So as many of you already know, and as I mentioned earlier, her father, he was US congressman, and his name is George Washington Julian. He became interested in women's rights around the same time that he adopted his abolitionist philosophy in the 1840s. So after helping to enact the 15th Amendment, which enfranchised African American men, he proposed a constitutional amendment to Congress in 1868 that's believed to be the first women's suffrage amendment and was brought forward by his own initiative, according to Clark. And that was something that Clark saw as what she said, another illustration of the prophetic quality of his mind and of his public efforts. So although the amendment was ultimately unsuccessful, the magnitude of his actions surely compelled Clark to follow in her father's political footsteps. Pivoting back to the Federation election. By September 1915, Clark had begun giving speeches at meetings around the state in an attempt to gain support for Cox and to discredit Stinson. Clark's influence did sway women to rethink their support, but it was not enough to change the vote in Cox's favor. Nonetheless, and perhaps more importantly, for Clark's personal career, her role as a loyal campaign manager earned her a lot of respect across the state. Many women really respected that she remained loyal to Cox and she stuck with her throughout. I remember one woman writing to Clark and calling Clark a splendid little fighter, which I thought was really cute. <laughs> A fellow club woman also wrote to Clark regarding her significance, stating that, you must know how you stand in the Federation. Your position reminds me of that of Jane Addams in the National Suffrage Organization. Whatever she says carries great weight and whatever she champions wins all the state votes at once. This writer went on to say that when you get up and women who are new ask who it is and are told it is Mrs. Grace Julian Clark, they are at once impressed because every last one of them knows who you are. So with such a strong stature among women, question how and why Clark failed to get Cox elected. Maybe Clark felt overly confident going into the campaign because of her standing. Even if that were true, the pushback she faced throughout the campaign definitely showed her blind spots. Many club women wrote to Clark begging her to back a different, safer, less controversial candidate for president, but she didn't back down. A fellow club woman wrote to Clark even accusing her of living a sheltered life where many of the ugly, repulsive things had been swept away from her. The same woman further pled with Clark that where friends had once put her on a pedestal and looked to her for guidance, Clark was now facing a federation crisis. Even Stimson wrote to Clark accusing her of obliviousness since she had lived in a small circle of fortunate, well-provided for women and a few successful men. And yes, Clark did innocently try to back a cause and candidate that she genuinely believed in. But as some women noted, she might have been blinded by her privileged role in society. So just some takeaways from this section before we move forward. Uh, although Clark was ultimately unsuccessful in getting Cox elected, she really began to find her voice as a political actor throughout this whole experience. She stood for what she believed, she took part in speaking engagements around the state, she remained loyal, and she made a name for herself. The campaign also suggests that Clark was heavily influenced by her father's advocacy of women's suffrage, and she may not have felt such a strong connection to her goals without that stimulus. But contests like this, like this election, that emerged from differences in personal circumstances, they also demonstrate that women, including Clark, they disagreed over many issues. And that would be true continuing into World War I, where women had to choose whether to focus on war-related work or to continue advancing the cause for suffrage. Which brings us to section two, her national work. So during the Federation campaign in 1915, much of the world had already found itself immersed in war. It wasn't until the United States formally entered World War I one on August 6, 1917, that Americans started to shift their priorities and their daily affairs. This was true for all suffragists and Americans and club women, not only in Indiana, but the nation. 
And as the war began affecting Americans directly, suffragists found themselves at a crossroads. Should they continue fighting for the vote or should they pause their efforts to focus attention on the home front? Well, they ultimately decided to continue their fight by aligning their club efforts with their patriotic duties. Oops, I lost my spot on my notes. Let me find them. Okay, so really at the crossroads of splitting their time between war and suffrage, the war put most women in a position of uncertainty. Um, in a letter to Clark, one woman said that she desperately wanted to assist with the war effort, um, but she was frustrated about not being able to do so. She stated to Clark, poor women, most of us, not you, could do so little. Through uh, her weekly column, which was called Women's Clubs, it ran in the Indy Star every week, and along with other leadership opportunities that Clark sees, Clark did acquire a very unique position among Indiana women during the war, and she served as an important source of information for all of them. Her influence on women and their access to information uh, was reflected in a letter to Clark which read, you are such a wholly worthwhile sort of person that everything you say and do is of value to me to know. So women around Indianapolis and across Indiana read Clark's Sunday column and it wasn't just because they were particularly interested in clubs but also because Clark wrote them and they looked to her for guidance. With the onset of war though Clark quickly assumed a leadership role within her community in other ways. She volunteered to lead a sign-up station for the Red Cross at the Irvington Post Office. She also introduced a resolution at a meeting held at the YWCA in Indianapolis that urged local women to pledge to do their part in war relief work and to also encourage other people to do the same. And after Clark's address at that meeting, about 400 women registered their intent to take part in war relief work. And by 1917, Clark had been appointed by Marie Edwards, who was the president of the Women's Franchise League of Indiana, to supervise the Women's Franchise League war work. Another interesting leadership role that Clark found herself in, she was speaking out in regard to the Library War Fund, which was a massive volunteer effort to raise funds and collect reading materials for American soldiers uh, in camp libraries at home and abroad. So Clark really saw value in maintaining some level of normalcy for victims of war and help provide this effort to provide American soldiers with an escape. During this time, Clark also urged the immediate consolidation of the Indiana Women's Franchise League and the Indianapolis Eagle Suffrage Association. The idea to make one suffrage association in the state, although it never actually came to fruition, it was in, in accordance with the United States Council of National Defense. Clark, among other women, believed in power behind numbers and that the consolidation of women both locally and nationally had a greater impact for the general cause of womanhood. But perhaps mo most importantly, Clark continued to write her weekly column, Women's Clubs, in an effort to help unify Hoosiers across the state um, throughout the war and keep them aware of war-related happenings. In October of 1917, Clark expanded her statewide influence by joining an Indianapolis organization of 14-minute women who spoke before clubs, church societies, and other organizations of women for about 14 minutes on the subject of food conservation. This organization was one wing that the local branch of the United States Food Administration, which was led by future President Herbert Hoover, um, they expected this group to spread important facts regarding food conservation. And the 14-minute women worked with four-minute men who also talked about food conservation. But you guessed it, only for four minutes. Members of the 14-minute women um, did include other prominent women, and their tours helped to develop their public speaking skills at hundreds of gatherings throughout the war. 
in January of 1918, the 14-minute women were enlisted in state service after their efforts had been found to be so effective that it was extended beyond the district where they originally began. This ex expansion included training for speakers to talk about the activities that were expected of women to aid in the war effort. So Clark, among these other women, they received a very unique training and experience in public speaking throughout this, this whole thing. Um, it's worth emphasizing here that public speaking was not a common skill for women to have at this time. So the experience further elevated Clark's public persona as she became increasingly recognized, influential, and of high demand to speak on national topics. And so by adhering to national requests for women to conserve, to consolidate, and to advocate, Clark saw the opportunity for women in Indiana and across the nation to demonstrate a patriotic spirit that she felt would serve the women's club's reputation well. Clark really saw that, that these patriotic efforts and these activities could be a calculated move to garner trust from the federal government and earn credit. This credit, Clark basically believed, would come in handy later politically when demanding the vote from Congress. So at the onset of war, Clark quickly supported President Woodrow Wilson and his war-related policies, although it did garner some concern from her confidants. One woman wrote to Clark and said, I want you to be careful. You are young yet, and I would love to see where your father sat in the house. Although Clark never publicly expressed an interest in elective office, Clark did eagerly participate in and support the war effort where and when she could. Uh, so much so that it may have been done without sufficient forethought about her future. But women's actions during this time, um, Clark knew would mean a great deal for the future of women in politics and women in leadership roles they really had to remain calculated and one step ahead of everything in order to retain their respected positions. The same woman who wrote to Clark, she further warned her that women take politics by tradition, the great mass of them, and are woefully content at present, just so, minus information. So this is just one example of recognition that Clark received regarding being strategically well-informed and it illustrates that Clark was very unique in uh, how informed she was compared to other women. So Clark's position as a valuable source of political information, it also reflects her ongoing dedication to fulfilling her father's legacy. Throughout the war, Clark processed her father's political papers really in an effort to document his work and it was sort of her side project. She was particularly interested in her father's role during the Civil War. And I believe that Clark's father, he really just continually inspired her to fulfill his legacy and motivated her strongly. So and in order for her to fulfill his legacy effectively, Clark, she really kept herself informed about political happenings, both historic and new. And she worked tirelessly to educate women so that they could be equally informed. Rather than just blindly following the masses during a time when, you know, women were eager to jump feet first into supporting the war effort, Clark, as a leader, had to remain on top of the ever-changing political arena. And she felt that the stakes for doing so were really high because she felt that their enfranchisement completely rested on it. So Clark's department in the Indianapolis Star, they quickly began publicizing club efforts related to the war with the Indianapolis News doing the same shortly after. Since Clark was the primary person sharing these efforts with the media, you could say that she strategically used the war as a mechanism to further spread information about suffrage and club happenings around the state, which made the groups more approachable and interesting to outsiders. And as the Federation and its activities gained traction in the media, more prominent individuals on the national level began looking toward Indiana and toward Clark. So much so that Clark herself received an invitation from national leaders to attend the Win the War for Permanent Peace Convention. Uh, this convention outlined the mission and the work of the League to Enforce Peace, 
And in addition, she also got an invitation to the Allied War Dinner that concluded the convention. Uh, this dinner had representatives of the Allied nations and they would speak there. Uh, representatives there include the United States, France, Canada, and Great Britain. So during World War I, Clark found herself on the national and even international stage giving war-related appearances and speeches, not just to women's clubs like she did during the 1915 election. Because Clark and other women pivoted their efforts toward war work during this time, women across the nation and in Indiana, regardless of affiliation, urged Congress to grant suffrage as a war measure. Marie Edwards, who was also the president of the Women's Franchise League in 1918, argued that winning the war was the league's immediate necessity and that winning it would surely guarantee suffrage. Clark supported Edwards' position and she argued that Another reason for consideration of suffrage as a war measure is found in the fact that while we are sending millions of our young men across the water to fight for democracy and civilization, being thereby deprived of their votes in important elections here at home, we yet permit millions of pro-Germans to exercise this function. We are too suspicious of the latter to allow them to work in munition plants, yet we calmly behold them voting for mayors, governors, judges, and members of Congress actually decided the elections in many places, while American women, wives and mothers of those splendid young men over in France, sit bound, but thank heaven, not dumb, witnesses of this infamy. So the war really illuminated women's ability to use genuine patriotism as a political tactic to achieve the vote through club and suffrage work. The war also brought about increased involvement in public activity although it was sometimes at the expense of suffrage work. However, women did not always put their work on pause completely, and that can be noted by Clark's continued political leadership, her journalistic efforts, and her emerging influence. One woman praised Clark in regard to her weekly column when she said, it reviews the efforts of the forward-looking women of Indiana and so ably makes clear that the great achievement of today was made possible by the unfailing courage of the pioneer who blazed the trail. I know how earnestly you have aided this great cause and how you have dignified its promotion. So Clark's actions demonstrate that even though women were unchallenged or were challenged during a time when they were so close to achieving the suffrage goal that they had been working on for nearly a century at this point, uh, they simultaneously stayed loyal to their country and their womanhood. As Clark herself explained, we women are truly patriotic, not only by knitting and doing the conventional kinds of war work, but by the utmost exertions to secure for the women of our country their rightful place as equal partners in the tremendously important enterprise of government. Women of all religious denominations, club women, women who work whether in the home or in the many fields outside, young women and old, colored women and white, all women with sufficient wit to discern right from wrong, daylight from night, should enlist in the present suffrage drive. So some takeaways from part two and Clark's work throughout World War I, you know, women definitely stayed loyal to both their country and their womanhood, which garnered them the vote in 1920. Clark also expanded her persona and interest to a national level during the war and kept Hoosier women informed about national politics throughout her column. And although women had finally obtained the vote, it wouldn't be the end of Clark's political career. Her interests were beginning to expand beyond national politics, and I think Clark's confidence as a political influencer grew as she started to set her eyes on larger international affairs. And as you'll see with part three, that's particularly surrounding Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations. So just to recap before we go into the final part today, prior to World War I, Clark focused her political efforts at the state level. These efforts included campaigning for Cox, for Cox as well as for local politics that affected the family. But during World War I, she turned her focus primarily to efforts at the national level through patriotic activities. By the time the war ended, she had helped convince many people that women were worthy of being included in political conversations throughout her 
um, time writing her newspaper column and through her own war initiatives. But with the end of war in sight, Clark, like I said, she started to turn her attention toward international affairs, especially as it related to the League of Nations, which I'll just call the League um, moving forward. And the League of Nations, it was the first worldwide intergovernmental organization whose mission was to maintain world peace. It wasn't long um, until Clark began receiving new requests to speak at clubs around the state regarding the League, and she definitely accepted the opportunity to do so. Other women who were asked to travel for similar speaking engagements often faced the choice of either family or work, um, but since Clark was married to an established attorney and didn't have children of her own, she had more privilege and freedom to pursue these kinds of opportunities. Because this part of Clark's life has so much to do with the League of Nations, I just want to say a few things to provide some background. Uh, according to historian David M. Kennedy, the idea of the League of Nations was discussed extensively prior to 1918 when it was made part of Wilson's 14 points. Uh, the 14 points, they, they were intended to be the basis for negotiating peace at the end of war. But while progressives often endorsed the League idea, others saw the covenant as a controversial expansion into international politics. The League was attached to the Treaty of Versailles, which is the treaty that formally ended World War I, and it was presented to the U.S. Senate in 1919. The Covenant, however, was not easily understood by most, and I really struggled with this section of my research because I had to really get my arms around the League of Nations and um, all the nuances associated with it. Um, but historian Ellis W. Hawley, I think, describes it well and says that the League is an organization that would function through two major organs, an assembly made up of all members and a council consisting of the major powers as permanent members and four smaller nations chosen by the assembly. And at the heart of the organization would be a mutual guarantee by all members of each other's independence and territorial integrity. So the League would not have an army nor a police force of its own, but countries belonging to the League might be called upon to take militaristic action in cases of aggressions by any foreign country that threatened world peace. So for that particular reason, uh, Wilson's League and um, this covenant could not come without controversy. Nonetheless, Clark received high praise for successfully introducing uh, club women in Indiana to the League to Enforce Peace, which was the precursor to the League of Nations. So Clark had been speaking on this um, for quite some time, even before the League of Nations was um, formally presented. For her, Clark felt that provoking club women to study components of the League would then lead them to actively support it. And after the war ended, Clark, she continued to receive requests to speak on behalf of political, political issues for two main reasons. One, because of her ability to remain available for the work, and two, because she was so well informed on current events. By this time, women all over the state really trusted Clark to know about the current political landscape. And upon receiving the vote, Women were seen by some as entering the political arena to perform the same duties that they had been doing for decades. So remember, by this time, women had organized and raised millions of dollars to elevate humanity through their war work. Clark had faith that those who fought so hard for humanity for the home and for one's own country during World War I would probably share a similar desire to see humanity flourish internationally. According to Clark, women felt that, you know, approving the League would move society toward, she says, a world understanding and world peace that had been the dream and the desire of the most enlightened men of all generations. Women wanted the covenant adopted because they believed in democracy. They believed in democracy in the home and in all areas of life. Above all, however, Clark really wanted Indiana's place to be in the matter or to be in the sun, that's her quote. She wanted Indiana's place to be in the sun when the final record was made up. In order for this to happen, Clark really recognized that even a small step forward in world peace would require a tremendous vote in the Senate. 
And so she wrote to one of the state's U.S. senators, Harry S. New, encouraging him to support the League. She pled to him and said, in the name of the women of Indiana, who constitute one half its citizenship, and in the name of that patriotism which knows no party when questions of humanities are involved, I respectfully beg that you will give the League of Nations Covenant your hearty support. Other prominent women, however, wrote to Clark admitting that they did not know much about the League of Nations or the League to Enforce Peace, but supported their general ideas. Although women tried to keep up to date with global politics, it was difficult for them to stay informed of changes in a timely manner. In an era when instant communication was non-existent like we have today, it often took days, if not weeks, to correspond or to receive news. And so women found themselves lacking enough information to confidently support any national um, or international efforts. A friend of Clark's perfectly illustrated this, um, this kind of mix of confusion when she signed her letter to Clark, I am yours somewhat chaotically, but affectionately. And I'm pretty sure that's how I'm signing off on all my emails in 2020. Um, so women, oh, the other thing I was gonna say before I move on. Women, they often corresponded about foreign affairs using uncertain language. Uh, there were a lot of references to the European question or the Russian situation. And I mean, I, I thought it was really interesting because that kind of unfamiliarity of what was actually happening in the world made it difficult to form educated opinions um, and really prevented women from supporting the League wholeheartedly. Uh, but, you know, as this news regarding the League became more difficult for anyone to fully understand, Clark increasingly spoke on its behalf. She was unwilling to accept any women's claims that they were not well, in, well informed enough to support it. So by 1920, Clark's name had been printed in newspapers across the state and her face was prominently publicized too. John Holtzman of the Democratic State Central Committee requested that Clark bring him a picture of her so that he could begin publicizing her in various counties. He said it had become an everyday matter to have demands for Clark's picture and he wanted to have photos to share, similar to maybe a contemporary headshot or a business card today so that he could circulate it wherever she spoke. One such speaking event was the Democratic County Tour, which was described as a political drive conducted solely by women with three squadrons of automobiles, four cars each, carrying Democratic women workers around the county. Clark was a headliner for this, and by the end of the tour, she had spoken in front of about 800 people. As for the League Covenant, it ultimately became a point of controversy between political parties, particularly in regards to Article, Article 10, with its pledge to protect the independence of all members with military force. Many Americans saw Article 10 as constituting a blank check to use American military power and viewed it as contradicting the U.S. Constitution, which states that only Congress can declare war. Clark, she was definitely adamant, though, that the League should not be made a party issue for women. So after women won the right to vote and the war had ended, women largely began aligning themselves with political parties based on their personal views rather than as a unified bloc. In the early days of suffrage, many women were aligning themselves largely as a bloc with the Republican Party since it had been more inclined to support women's rights. But that changed after women started to feel frustrated with the party because they felt ratification took so long. Clark, too, is beginning, beginning to favor Democratic legislation, and that could be why she so aggressively supported the League. Some women remained closely aligned with the Republican Party and condemned Clark, who claimed to be a Republican but declared herself in support of Democratic policy. One woman criticized Clark saying to her, you are a traitor not only to the Republican Party, but also to your country when you declare yourself for a League of Nations. I am convinced that you have not studied the situation carefully. You have merely accepted these men's views. So given these continuing disparities um, among women, even post-enfranchisement, Clark felt very compelled to speak on behalf of what she advocated for in order to garner new supporters. Her efforts, however, were definitely challenged at times. Questioning her credibility, 
One male correspondent wrote, I would sure like to know how Grace, a way out here in the woods of Indiana, happens to know more about this question, which is a mighty big one, than the persons themselves who invented it. Clark garnered further criticism in one letter with the simple message, Madam, you are a damned fool. Regardless, Clark continued to promote the league as a body that would promote better working conditions for all, and she remained focused on her mission. And her switch to favor, or her switch to favor democratic policies were, it was definitely correlated with her League of Nations efforts, no doubt about it. In 1920, she was asked to be one of four women who joined a men's committee of five to meet the Democratic Party's vice presidential candidate, Franklin D. Roosevelt, for dinner. Clark was even asked later to go to the Indiana Democratic Club to meet Roosevelt at the station and pick him up upon his arrival. So the party clearly recognized Clark's value as she publicly advocated on behalf of their policies. She was even rec recruited for rebuttal as needed whenever opponents would speak publicly against the League. According to correspondence, she was also trusted with anonymous information that would help defeat presidential candidate Harding and use this information in her speeches, although the details of that scandal were not stated in the letter. But by this time, Clark was perceived as having a real public influence and she was trusted with select insider information. Outside of the league, Clark continued flexing her political muscles in other ways. Um, after women won the right to vote, she began co-authoring a women in politics column that ran every Sunday in the Indianapolis Star. Uh, the column, it was intended to set out activities of women as new voters from both the Democratic and Republican perspective. So Clark represented the weekly Democratic viewpoint and Mrs. Joseph B. Keeling presented the Republican viewpoint. Clark did receive a lot of letters in response to her new column from fans of her father as she became increasingly known. One reader drew comparisons to her father saying, it seems to me I can hear your father speaking through your pen, his wide-eyed vision of the main issue, his blazing devotion to the right firmly choked down to a moderation of statement emphasizing rather than weakening the force of the conviction behind it. Friends of Clark's father further reminded her you know what a bold, daring, unflinching man your father was. So Clark definitely learned that boldness and strength from her father and saw the League as a truly humane policy that she needed to defend. And throughout her career, there were always comparisons between the work she did and that of her father. At one point, another acquaintance of her father's wrote to her to thank her for the work she's doing to educate both their new duties under the 19th Amendment. Clark, according to this man, had been passed down the halo of inheritance from her father, and both her and her father's generations noted similarities between their work. Um, so, you know, I argue and I believe that without the influence of her father, Clark probably would not have been instilled with the knowledge and the confidence and the humanitarianism that advanced her own work and reputation. And even though her father was a true Republican, the values that he bestowed upon her continued throughout her work, regardless of political party affiliation. And so as for the League Covenant that Clark had spent much of her post-suffrage career advocating for, um, the Senate chose not to ratify the Treaty of Versailles and decided, or yeah, sorry, I thought I said that wrong. They chose not to ratify and it was really it, what it came down to is Article 10. It was too controversial. Um, and so they decided that the United States would not be joining the League of Nations. Nonetheless, um, I think that her determination, her passion, um, her belief in the League really granted her some new opportunities to assist the Democratic Party. So in September of 1920, Clark helped to organize Indiana's division of a nationwide campaign for presidential candidate James Cox and his running mate Franklin D. Roosevelt. And Clark also continued to work with the newly organized League of Women Voters of Indiana, which was formerly the Women's Franchise League. But beyond 1920, Clark devoted her efforts on people and things that she cared deeply about and primarily focused on her community of Irvington. But she also went on to serve as a member of the Old Marion County Board of Charities and the City Plan Commission and also headed Indianapolis's first employment office under the appointment of President Wilson. 
Park was also, I think this is interesting, part of a commission that chose the names of authors to be engraved on the outer frieze of the Indianapolis Marion County Public Library. So check that out. After years of poor health, however, Clark ultimately passed away in her Irvington home in 1938 at 72 years of age. Um, she was memorialized for her role in shaping women into political beings and in newspapers across the state, they mourned with the Indianapolis Star noting that a torchbearer has fallen by the wayside. So just some takeaways from, I know we're coming up on our time, but takeaways from this section as well, kind of my overall research. One, Clark was unique in her ability to speak out for her own values, likely in large part due to the influence of her father. Two, Clark differentiated herself from other women by becoming a political actor rather than a reformer. Even though she never ran for political office herself, she was definitely a political actor in the sense that she directly impacted campaign outcomes and influenced legislative discussions. Third, um, although she seemed defeated at face value, she remained undefeatable by continuing to advocate for what she believed in. And lastly, I think examining activities of women like Clark at the individual and local levels provides a more accurate, inclusive narrative of women's suffrage and their political movement. So we need to find better ways and more additional ways to support research on women's history in Indiana before, during, and after the 19th Amendment in order to have the whole story. I removed a lot of the technical references to make the talk today feel more approachable and less academic, but please feel free to refer to my thesis. You can find it for free um, on IUPUI ScholarWorks. Um, I would also mention if you're interested in doing more research of your own, the Indiana State Library has a large portion of Clark's collection digitized now, so you can do it from your couch or when we're back to some level of normalcy, you can visit the library and do some digging of your own. Lastly, um, I am actually working with the Indiana Historical Bureau to install a historic marker for Grace Julian Clark in front of her Irvington home. Um, we're working on the marker text right now, but you can see on the right that's an example of what the marker will look like, except it'll be for Grace Julian Clark, and that's her home in Irvington on the top of your screen. So if you would be interested in donating, the marker is definitely not cheap. It costs somewhere close to $3,000 because of the material and the labor required to create the marker. Um, if you're interested in donate, donating to Clark's marker, please uh, shoot me an email. I am putting together a crowdfunding campaign, um, definitely looking for donations. And right now it's pretty hard to find um, or to fundraise with everything else going on. So I would appreciate anything you might be able to contribute to that. Okay, that was a lot of information. I know we don't have a ton of time for questions, but um, I'm happy to answer any. Oh my God, Jackie, that was incredible. I feel like I learned so much about the city, about Grace Julian Clark, and just the fight that she had to go through in order to um, you know, bring about women's suffrage and a lot of positive change here in our community, not just yeah. here in Indy, but like on a national level and on the international stage. Yeah. That was incredible. Oh, um, if, if you want to leave that slide up with your information for oh, the yeah. donate, yeah, we could, um, so people would just have that. And I did get a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and if you guys have a few minutes, I'll just ask Jackie a couple of questions about her research. So Adrian brought up a good point about um, communication. Like today, it's, it's really different how people are organizing. Um, especially using social media. We have Twitter, Facebook, all those things. How were women and Grace organizing in their time and what kind of communication strategies were they employing? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I picked up on was it was a lot of just old fashioned correspondence and writing each other letters that probably took a while to get there. Um, I, there were often letters I came across that would say like, oh, please disregard my, what I said in my other letter. I found new information, you know, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> um, but I think also what made Clark unique is that she had this platform with the Indie Star. And I often came across letters too, where women would say, can you please send me your, uh, you know, a copy of your latest article. So even though it was the Indie Star, women across the state were, um, 
looking toward that article to, to communicate and to learn, so. Wow, that's incredible. That's really, and um, the next question we had was from Adrian. Um, she wanted to know, was there any correspondence or interaction with Madam C.J. Walker and Grace Julian Clark? Not that I came across. I, I will say I put a dent in her collection. I did not go through the whole thing. Yeah. Um, it's huge. But what I came across, um, there were definitely notable figures, but none that I saw with her, which is surprising. But I do know she was involved with um, clubs in the African American community, so I wouldn't be surprised if they knew each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And then there was another question about correspondence. Um, is there, was there any correspondence that you saw between Grace Julian Clark and her father? You know, no, not correspondence. Um, but she did write three books on her father. And so to me, that felt like her, almost like her love letter to him. It yeah. almost felt like she was talking to him um, and just trying to make other people see what she saw in him. Um, so I never came across correspondence between the two. There was one letter with her brother, um, who I didn't even know she had a brother until I came across that letter. And they were bonding over their father's legacy. So there was definitely a lot about her father, but not with her father directly. Wow, that's amazing. That's so great. And it just seems like the, the, the Federation of Clubs was such an important organization and in, in just bringing all of these women's groups together mm -hmm. and then going on to launch so many um, political careers here in the city and then the state. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the, the Federation of Clubs? Yeah, so I didn't do a whole lot of research on the organization as a whole, but I completely agree with you that it really was the center of many communities, primarily for women, obviously. Um, it was usually what I came across in my research, um, educated women um, who had the time to meet and to talk about big ideas and big things, but that's not always the case. It was very um, diverse, yeah. but I do think it, it just kind of snowballed into something much larger over time and it really became the impetus for um you know the fight for suffrage yes and that became a big priority for a lot of clubs wow such an amazing presentation um i want to thank everyone for attending i want to thank jackie sweetheart for sharing her amazing research with us um so yeah we will keep the conversation going also you know donate to the um, the marker to get Grace Julian Clark's um, historical marker and there's Jackie's contact information there. Um, thank you all so much for attending. Please fill out the virtual survey. It is in the chat um, and we will see you next time. Thank, thank you. you everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you. I'm gonna stop recording.